All right, hi everyone. This is Megan Stewards. I'm with the Girl Scouts of Virginia Skyline Council. And today as part of step two of the Senior Eco Explorer Badge, I am taking uh, option three, go to a local farm. I happen to live on a local farm and my husband, Davey Stewards, with me today. Hi, Davey. Hey. <laughs> um, is gonna explain to us uh, about a permaculture farm, which is what we're starting here, and kind of explain the difference of that compared to our idea of um, more traditional farms like corn or a chicken farm or just cows, that kind of thing. And uh, yeah, so I just want to explain that's my husband, which is why we are not wearing our face masks and keeping the distance apart. So, all right. Hi, Davey, take it away. What hey. It's a permaculture farm. Um, a permaculture farm is a farm that relies on resiliency and diversity in order for us to get a sustainable harvest. So it really um, is anchored in the idea that ecosystems are more resilient when they have more characters involved in the system. And when I speak about resiliency, that's the idea that in the face of stress or um, a natural disaster, for example, or a man-made uh, problem, that you're going to have other options in order to still get a harvest from. Um, so this is a little bit different than conventional farming, uh, which for the sake of, of this, I will call monoculture farming, meaning one sim single crop. Um, one single corn growing in a massive giant field, one single soybean growing in a massive giant field. This is a very different type of operation that we're establishing here. Um, it's really important to note um, in permaculture the idea of uh, succession. Now this is a term that comes from ecology and that is that uh, our, our farm creates more stability and resiliency over a longer years of time. The longer that it's been in existence, the more harvest we're going to get, the more stability there is in the farm, and the more resiliency there is in the farm. Okay, real quick. So as part of that long-term planning that we're doing, I want to explain that we've also, we've only been here about a month and some of the, the um, crops, would you call them? Yeah. Crops, um, such as what we're standing in front of here, which are um, a variety of fruit trees, have only been planted for, these were planted by someone else. 2013. 2013, okay. And then we have moved here to kind of take it to the next level and we've only been here about a month. So um, we're just beginning that. So a lot of what you'll see has kind of just been started. And then the other important thing, Davey, that um, the girls need to learn about as part of this badge is biodiversity. And you mentioned the uh, variety of characters that you would have on a permaculture farm. So is that the same thing as biodiversity? Absolutely. And biodiversity really uh, being a number of, it's diversity is the number of different types of species that you have present at a time. Biodiversity can apply to um, not just, um, you know, a chicken versus a cow, but say a certain type of chicken versus another type of chicken is also a difference in biodiversity. So depending on the way that their genes are expressing, that is also a, a part of what you would term biodiversity. And also, would you consider a plant as a part of the species, right? So Absolutely. Okay, so let's um, walk them around and show them while we uh, talk some more about all the different species and biodiversity here. Show you a couple things. So these are apples um, starting to appear on this tree here which is really beautiful um, and we have a couple a number of different fruit trees here this is also this is a peach tree right here um, it's a little hurt it's a little stressed from a peach borer that's come in um, but you can see it's getting chocked full of peaches right there now in a permaculture farm nice and fuzzy. yeah nice and fuzzy peaches in a permaculture farm um, each fruit tree, and this is what I'm establishing now, I have these plants in our greenhouse that are growing, you accompany each fruit tree with three or four other smaller plants. Um, and each of these plants, this is really key to biodiversity, each of these plants provides a certain ecosystem function that supports the production of fruit and the health of your fruit tree. Um, the, the plant that comes to mind first is comfrey, and what this plant does, and I believe we do have some comfrey over here actually, um, what this plant does is it grows big giant leaves 
and those big giant leaves flop down they actually break down on the top of the soil and they provide additional nutrients to i think when the guy came and mowed out here he mowed over the comfrey um, they provide additional nutrients to and as you're walking show them uh, what we're walking towards yeah um sorry meg you want to this is this is another fruit tree here and we do have some comfrey here um it's it's right down here it got run over a little bit this is our comfrey plant here um, and what I'm what I want to get at here is express that when you have these three to four different plants around your fruit tree being a dynamic bioaccumulator that's what the comfrey is it's going deep down into the soil bringing up nutrients from the subsoil and putting them on the surface where the feeder roots for your root tree can get the nutrients that it otherwise would not have biologically available to it other plants bring in predatory wasps um, and predatory insects that actually help to support um, defending the tree from different invasion and invading predators. Um, another type of plant would be simply bringing more bees um, and pollinators to the tree. But probably the most important aspect of this biodiversity is actually in the soil biodiversity. So the types of arthropods, worms, and bacteria that live in the soil will actually help your production of your fruit trees. So one of the big things that we're doing on this farm is spraying effective microorganisms, the certain microorganisms in the soil that bring out um, the nutrients that are needed in the soil for your tree to get what it needs to uh, produce good fruit. So soil biodiversity, plant biodiversity, um, and then having a certain large number of different kinds of trees um, that are on your property, because if the apples don't set well one year, your peaches might do really well, and then you still get a good harvest from them. All right, so I also, I see before us a number of other species that we're working on. So this is our canvas that we're working here. Believe it or not, um, we actually planted this mound completely in potatoes here. We have another mound that's completely planted in potatoes. And we have planted about 60 different berries um, on this property. Those are actually down here. And what you see here is very different than conventional farming uh, because we're harvesting water uh, through these ditches that you see here. These are called bioswales. They are built on the contour line, meaning it's flat, the same elevation from one side of the swale all the way to the other side of the swale. And what that does is it allows for water to get trapped every time that it rains and it soaks into the groundwater so that there's more water available for our plants. So we don't have to water these plants as much as if it was just a um, allowing all of the sheet flow water to wash right over the farm and keep moving. And uh, these are, we call these bioswales. And each of these swales, we have plants that we're starting in our greenhouse to plant with our fruit trees. We're also planting a lot of potatoes and sweet potatoes in these swales right now because some of the fruit trees we're planting this year are not going to produce a lot of food. Um, they're gonna produce a lot more food next year and the year after. So we wanna make sure that we get some good food and some good harvest this year still. And we are obtaining a yield by putting in these sweet potatoes that we're gonna grow and the potatoes that we're gonna grow. Now here are some more fruit trees that we planted this season. Cherries. It's a Montmorency cherry right here. It's a sour cherry. And we just had a little ladybug fly off, um, which is great to, to talk about um, the beneficial insects that are in our ecosystem, um, like ladybugs, which feed on aphids, uh, which can be a really huge pest for all of your vegetable plants uh, in particular. And I want to talk about this for a quick second. There's, there's a whole um, field of um, entomology, that's the study of insects, called integrated pest management. And what IPM, integrated pest management, does is it looks at what certain insects are specifically able to protect your plants against predatory um, insects. Basically, the insects that'll eat your plants, what are the insects that eat those insects? <laughs> And then you specifically release those insects into your ecosystem and you look to build habitat for those types of insects, meaning certain types of plants that are known to host those insects. You put those around your trees as a way to bring in the beneficial um, insect life. 
Wow. We are always going to have insects in our ecosystems. Mm -hmm. It is a real fallacy to think that we want to kill the insects in our ecosystems in order to protect our plants. I would rather have a small bit of my apple crop get lost than to spray all of these or have a couple of you know spots on my apples and to spray all of this in an insecticide which would kill the insects, both beneficial and bad insects at the same time. So an, an example of a bad insect would be a tick. <laughs> and we have another species that we're raising here. Oh, you wanna go, see those? You wanna go yeah, see those guys? Yeah. Those gals, um, I should say. <laughs> um, to take care of some of the more negative insects. And we're introducing another species that we're gonna show you that you're all very familiar with. And they're still in a pretty cute face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so on this farm in the center here, we're actually surrounded by cows. And I'm hoping we could get some rabbits. I'd like to get two rabbits by the end of the season. And we also want to build up a fish population here so that we can have sustainable harvest of tilapia in a system called aquaponics. Um, and the other uh, bit of animals that we're gonna have on our farm are baby chicks. And we're, well, they're not gonna be babies forever. <laughs> they're babies now, um, but our chickens. Uh, we wanna have a lot of eggs that we can provide to our family and to other families here locally. And this is where we are brooding and raising our little baby chicks. Well, and the other reason we have the baby chicks or chickens is to use their poop for uh, compost processing. Hey, little baby chicks. You wanna <laughs> grab one, Meg? Yeah, they're getting so big now. They don't have, they don't have names yet. Yeah, come here, We don't always name our little babies. Yeah, so they're starting to get feathers. They're entering their sort of adolescent phase. They're not so baby, but they still have some fuzz on them. See things. We have yeah. 20, 23 chickens here. Yeah. And we'll be utilizing, we'll have probably three different chicken coops out in our mm -hmm. um, field this year That'd in different cool. areas. And the chickens provide multiple functions. One is uh, fertilizer for our fruit trees. Another function is, is that they help to eat away grass. Mm -hmm. And... Um, in general, we are trying to create more of a um, system covered in wood chips than grass because the wood chips are better for our fruit trees yeah. than grass is better for our fruit trees. And it's really good when if you have chicks to handle them as much as possible so that they're comfortable with humans. Where's the chickens? Am I getting, am I getting in there? Let's see. Yeah, you got them. Hey, little chickies. <laughs> we like bringing our baby out here. Um, she checks out the chickens. Yeah, and it's good to handle them as much as you can so they're comfortable um, with humans. And they'll follow you around like little puppies. And let's not lie, here's our little favorite species on the farm. <laughs> there he is! And he helps with groundhogs. He helps with groundhogs. <laughs> uh, we, there's quite a few groundhogs on this property and he actually, hate to say it, but he caught one the other day. We don't want to harm the animals, but we also uh, want to create a balance in in our space. There's probably about 50, 30 groundhogs living right in the proximity here. Um, there's a lot. Um, All right. So any other? Um, oh, and the other aspect that is um, a part of this badge is understanding it invasive species and how that mm. plays in to farms and, and mm -hmm. biodiversity. Mm -hmm. I, I had the privilege of being an uh, invasive species uh, plant manager for a forest for two years before in the past. And invasive species cause a lot of damage in our croplands and our pasture lands. They also cause a, can cause a significant amount of damage even to uh, piping um, and uh, civ civil engineered projects in, in municipalities. So like a water pipe team? Yeah, like or? a water pipe. Mm -hmm. um, there's a ter certain type of muscle that will take over and clog up water pipes. It's really common in the Great Lakes. Um, in, f in farming, there, the diversity that we're trying to get all the time, an invasive species basically will, will take over, just so we understand what it is, it'll take over an area and decrease the diversity that would be, you would want, you would see typically in the area. So what's so, an example of a really prevalent um, invasive species? In this area, kudzu, um, but kudzu you mostly the, will kudzu see. Kudzu is the vine that covers, you know, a range of trees. Yeah, and probably um, my my least favorite invasive species, least, my most 
my most hated <laughs> invasive species in this area is probably tree of heaven. People call it paradise tree around here um, or Ilanthus. And this is a certain tree that uh, will, will just completely colonize an entire area. It's important to note that the majority of invasive species were actually brought here by people intentionally, cultivated by people before we knew uh, that there was a real problem with it. So we are the ones who have created a lot of these problems through our own unconscious choices. Um, and, and I would say with invasive plants, a monoculture cornfield to me is an invasive process. <laughs> uh, and even though it's made by people, even though it's feeding us, even though it's farming, that is one single plant that has been able to completely invade and take over acres and acres and states upon states upon the entire Midwest. Um, and that is decreasing our biodiversity. And we are spraying chemicals all over these plants, chemically engineering these plants, just so we can get a harvest from them. And we have to use all sorts of chemical fertilizers on these plants that creates so much along its chain of, of production of, of greenhouse gas emissions just so we can get this one plant to eat um, so we can put it in our Coca-Cola. And that, well, <laughs> and that's an example of an ethical um, issue because some people might argue that it's worth it to feed the masses and, and to make sure people have food on their tables, but um, there's definitely trade-offs to consider, but that's a whole, that's a, I would say that's another big topic to get into. And really quick, as far as invasive species goes, what about native versus non-native? Well, so so uh, the bugs that are native to our ecosystems evolved for uh, eons with the certain plants that are in this ecosystem. So when you have another plant uh, that doesn't have the specific um, kind of pollinator um, flower signal that a bug is used to, um, that plant doesn't necessarily provide the nectar source that a certain uh, native moth uh, or a native butterfly uh, would need to survive. So that is one of the big problems with invasive species. Um, and we have lost habitat in mass um, from this corn invasive invasion. <laughs> um, and, 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 and I don't want to harp on it too much, but the, you know, that's really like what I think about invasive species that I think about. Um, and I want to say that these permaculture farms um, in the future, as this becomes more stable, it will look like huge nut trees it will be a number of fruits it will be flowers producing all around it we will have i forgot to mention this we're going to have bees on this farm as well so it'll be bees buzzing around and it will be also be plants that are known to be um provide medicine medicinal benefits when you use them a lot of the plants that will be cultivated underneath the trees like elderberry um, like elderberry is one in particular that we're going to plant a lot of here um comfrey is another one um lavender, bee balm. Uh, there are all sorts of beautiful native plants um, as well as non-invasive, um, non-native plants that we can plant here and cultivate and get good medicine, get good food. Um, and your food is our medicine. Ultimately, you know, eating clean food is some of the best medicine. Clean, healthy, living uh, food is some of the best medicine for us always. So we want to be creating this ecosystem that is full of life and full of vibrancy for our personal health and for our family's health and, and share that knowledge and share that bounty with our neighbors and our friends and our family. Awesome, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Davey. And I hope this was educational for you all. We touched on a lot of different uh, topics and important and interesting practices. And um, let us know if you have any questions and um, I'll include Davey's contact information. He's agreed to, um, speak with any of you if you have questions as well you want to talk over the phone or a zoom meeting or that kind of thing um, so thank you all and good luck with your badge good luck with your badge and i'd love to talk more about non-native plants with you all anytime of the, or in permaculture anytime um, and thanks for my beautiful wife megan for getting me out here to talk <laughs> about what i love <laughs> all right thanks davy thanks mm -hmm.